Okay, I tried um, an old Flanders and Swan, The War of 14 to 18, last time, and I got a copyright strike, but only in Japan, strangely enough. Funny how they go. This time I tried Sabaton's Great War, just a short little clip. Let's see what happens with the gods of the copyright headers, or the copyright boxes. Uh, uh, there's a Rudyard Kipling line, I'll have to look it up. Anyway, here we are for part two of Slaughter on the Crozat Canal. And there just were so many men dying in this battle. Uh, you know, we always hear about the Somme and uh, maybe Passchendaele, but the fatality rate in this battle was every bit as high in terms of casualties per day and all the rest. The difference being, of course, that it was a war of manoeuvre. The photo in the background, though, doesn't show World War I casualties. I was just looking for a photo from my, excuse me, from my photo album. Uh, that's actually at Becklingen War Cemetery in um, North Germany near Soltau. That's where my World War II uncle is buried. I made an episode about him who was in the RNZAF. You can look back on that if you're interested. So just a brief recap to bring us back to where we were. We've been looking at the German assault on the Crozat Canal, in particular the one that was spearheaded by the Graf Kleist von Nollendorf Grenadiers from Prussia. So they were in the 10th Division, which you can see on the map here, and their route of advance was Essany, and then they were aiming for a farm, Kamar Farm. It was just a little bit southwest of there that they were crossing the Crozat Canal with pontoon bridges and, well, pontoon boats initially, and then a pontoon bridge. And their initial target for the assault was the crossroads and the train station at Flavi. Now, at the end of episode one, we got to the actual assault and crossing of the canal. Now we're taking it through to the assault on Flavi. So let's continue with the Prussian account, which is my translation from the history of the uh, Graf Kleist Prussian Grenadiers. At four o'clock in the morning, it was not yet dawn, the Grenadier Regiment headed for Klaste, five kilometres south of Essany, just under three kilometres from the canal and Kamar Farm. The division was tasked with throwing the enemy across the canal, forcing a passage behind them, and advancing to Flavie Le Martel's train station. Well, said all that already. That's where they were going, and you can see the terrain has changed very little. Um, quite remarkable, in fact, that it's so similar in 2023 as it was when this trench map was made for 1918. They call it the St. Quentin Canal here, but it's it's the Crozat Canal. Now, they do make some mention of the Chateau de Savrenois, I believe that's the pronunciation, de Savrenois, um, and you can see it here, I've circled it on the map, but one thing you have to bear in mind here, whenever you're seeing a mention of a farm or the mention of a chateau or a village or anything else do not assume it's an intact structure in fact you should assume the exact opposite everything in this area is an absolute ruin some of it because it was fought over but some of it by deliberate destruction this was because of a german operation known as operation elberg and uh, the German accounts sometimes even refer to this area as being in the Elberich zone. Now, what exactly does this mean? Well, Unternehmen Elberich, or Operation Elberich, was the grand German plan to shorten their defensive front as the war was dragging on. And in fact, if you've seen that movie 1917, this really is the central plot that lies behind the whole story. The Germans have suddenly withdrawn and they've got to work out where it is and there's certain things that happen in that movie like they encounter a, a ruined farm and you can see the Germans have deliberately cut down all of the um, all of the orchard and just deliberate destruction. So the Germans had had time to prepare the Hindenburg line um, which is not actually what the Germans called it. We'll probably talk about that in a future episode but they had prepared a massive line of solid defences, and then they would withdraw, leaving the territory which they had possessed in absolute ruin. It was a deliberate policy of absolute scorched earth to just destroy everything, to make this a ruined landscape, which the Allies would then have to advance through, 
with booby traps and other things, and of course wouldn't be able to get any advantage of it because you know there wouldn't be any intact houses and all the rest. So it was, well, you could call it, if you like, a deliberate war crime, and it was certainly one of the things that contributed to the bitter vengeance of the Treaty of Versailles, because there was huge anger, and while militarily it might have made sense from a public relations point of view, um, it really was a disaster. Now, what I found fascinating, perhaps shocking is a better word, was there was actually a book celebrating Operation Elberich published in Germany. Like, particularly, look on the bottom right, you can see this picture, you can see the, um, you know, the Germans blowing the, you know, things up and all of the rest. Now, when you see the date of publication, 1939, well, then it perhaps makes more sense. Um, and, well, what a harbinger of things to come in World War II, where the thing that was considered one of their greatest war crimes of World War I gets celebrated as, yeah, that's how you do it in 1939. And, well, gee, the Nazis really took that lesson to heart, didn't they? Uh, the wrong lesson, I would say. I think most people would say. But all the same, isn't it kind of shocking to see they had a book celebrating the Operation Elberich? Elberich, by the way, is the German version of Oberon. And in sort of Nordic mythology, he's this funny... Well, not funny, but he's a dwarf creature. He features in Wagner, amongst other things. So, here we have it. They, they got across the canal. Now their target is Flavie Le Martel, which you can see down there on the map. And this is basically the main thrust of their advance. And I managed to find a photo of the train station at Flavie Le Martel. Uh, yes, I'm sure it's probably a lot more pathetic than you imagined. These are not major towns. These are just you know, marks on a map, almost small villages, well, big villages, small towns, call it what you will, and the, these Prussian grenadiers, their targets of assault, like Kamar Farm, would just been two or three farmhouses, they were points on a map that was con were controlling the German advance, each division and regiment were given certain markers on the map that it was their job to advance so that they weren't crossing each other's paths, but just because you have been given the task of capturing a certain destination and losing, you know, dozens or even hundreds of men to capture it. Well, that is kind of the futility of World War One, isn't it? Capture, go capture that hill. Go capture that ridge. Well, in this case, this is the chief point of assault. It hardly looks like it was worth it, does it? And I found a number of photos of Flavie, Ma Flavie Le Martel, and you can see again here, some of the buildings were not totally destroyed. I mean, there were ruins, but you could have at least got a little shelter from the rain from them, I guess, and they would be a place where snipers and, um, you know, British defenders could take up some positions. So you can see on the bottom left what it should have looked like, and on the bottom right, well, that's a closer look at what it actually would have looked like during the battle that we're talking about. And this applies whether we're talking about Essene or Class Day or Jussi, or all of the other villages at Anwar that come up in the story. Don't assume that you look, you're, they're fighting over something in the bottom left. Assume they're fighting over a pile of rubble. Okay, let's get back to it. The Prussian Grenadiers. March 23rd, Flavi Le Martel and Cuny, March 22nd. So the right wing of the attacking armies in possession of the second line of enemy combat positions. The centre had taken the third resistance line. The 18th Army's left wing made great progress again, and by the morning of the 23rd had already crossed the canal. At 7 o'clock in the morning, the crossing of all the infantry of the 10th Infantry Division was completed. First on rafts and pontoons, then on the pontoon bridge so quickly made by the pioneers. In endless succession, the batteries, ammunition columns, and baggage went over. On the bank, just one, the three regiments are preparing, partly under artillery fire, for further action and attack. So each division has three regiments in it, and these Prussian grenadiers are the spearhead of the 10th Division. The grenadiers... Those on the right and the 47th are expected to take the railway embankment at Flavy le Martel, which is about two kilometres from the crossing point. The 398th Infantry Regiment will follow the attack. Major Gustav takes the 1st Battalion on the right and the 2nd Battalion in the first line. The 1st shall proceed to Flavy Station and take it on the right. 
the second via Savrenoir Chateau towards the railway embankment and Flavy village. The Fusilier battalion is staggered to the right as a right flank guard to follow. On the right wing is the first company, and on its left is the third company. Each is assigned a machine gun platoon from the first company of Sergeant Schendel. It's after 10 a.m., before it begins. Now, let's swap again to hear something of the British side, the history of the Rifle Brigade, because the Rifle Brigade had been defending. It was both the 8th and the 9th battalions that had supposed were supposed to be holding the canal and had failed, and this is what they're going through on the other side. The account by Captain Squire. There were only 130 all ranks together, with about 80 of the 7th Battalion details on left and some 60 of the 8th Battalion, uh, 60th, Flavi and Cuny. There did not appear to be any other troops at all, but this body, with no bombs or rifle grenades, only two Lewis guns and a limited amount of small arms ammunition, held in check strong enemy forces from 8am until dark. No ammunition was wasted. Fire was controlled. During the 12 hours' contact with the enemy, three distinct positions were taken up, within 400 yards of each other, and no withdrawal was made until large numbers of the enemy were round both flanks. Now, there were actually fragments um, of multiple other battalions who were mixed in with this. So it's, again, it's... I've criticised some of the accounts in the Rifle Brigade book before. Uh, they overplayed the role of what the Rifle Brigade was doing, or perhaps exaggerated how much of the canal they had to follow to defend. For example, the Rifle Brigade claimed they had to hold 2,700 yards of the canal, which is patent nonsense. Um, but there were other troops beyond what they're describing, but they were just fragments, you know, maybe squad strength here and there, individuals who had attached themselves to any organised body. Let's carry on. Fire was so steady and deadly that the enemy never more than once dared to attempt a frontal attack, and thus time was saved while he had to work round the flanks. The enemy appeared... Oh, what am I doing a German accent for? This is an English account. Fire was so steady and deadly that the enemy never more than once dared to attempt a frontal attack, and thus time was saved while he had to work round the flanks. The enemy appeared to consist of fresh troops and clean new equipment. They advanced in columns of fours and companies according to a well-planned method. When fire upon... Their immediate action seemed almost automatic in its promptness and good order, and had obviously been practiced as a drill. Their method of advancing by companies round the valleys, using dead ground to the full, was characteristic of new, well-trained, and fresh troops. Well, this is 100% true. They were, well, they weren't new exactly. They were combat veterans. They'd been fighting on the Eastern Front, but they'd been rested up after the defeat of Russia. They'd been trained up, and they absolutely had been trained in these new open maneuver combat tactics. Well, it was the beginning of Blitzkrieg, as I've said before. This was where it all began. The attack was supported. The attack were supported by artillery fire on our positions, directed at times by as many as seven German aeroplanes at at once, which hovered above and fired very lights as signals. Light trench mortars were also employed with great accuracy. After, well, back to the Germans. After a short march through the rough terrain, the companies unexpectedly encounter a closed, fiercely firing English rifle line. They attack, but the attack does not really get going. Then, Officer Deputy Holman, of the first company, ignoring the angry fire, jumps in front of his men and pushes them forward by his example and encouraging words. An unforgettable sight will stay with me, reports the leader of the first company, Lieutenant Ryman. As I, running far ahead of the front, turned around and saw behind me the skirmish line charging forward. The assault line stops again. Lieutenant Ryman sees some Englishmen running back with their hands raised. Immediately he jumps up, swinging his stick, and with a huzzah he goes after the Englishmen. Beside him charges the brave Schendel, his pistol in hand. His machine gun crews cannot keep up because they are carrying their heavy guns. Many other men, too, could not keep up with the rapid advance, because the grenadiers had all experienced three sleepless nights. So it happened that in many cases the officers, with a handful of men, who were thrown together from all sorts of companies, stormed far ahead of the mass of their own men. The third company suffered heavy casualties the first time they hit the enemy. Thus, the distinguished NCO Sergeant Bremer received a severe wound on the neck and bled to death as he was positioning his machine gun next to Lieutenant Kyres. Now, 
It's interesting, even though the British were suffering mass casualties, most of the British accounts really don't dwell on it. They might occasionally mention individuals that they knew being hit, but they're really not listing it. The German accounts are quite interesting. They really, really want to mark out who's falling. I guess it was important to them to mark the individuals, and I sympathize with this. You can see from the way I tell these accounts, I care about the individuals. I want to know their stories. Who was this man? What happened to him? Did he survive the war? What did he do afterwards? Where did he come from? These kind of questions. I, I really enjoy that part of the research. Now, how many... Let's look at the big picture for a moment. Overall, in the German Spring Offensive, <coughs> it's estimated that the um, the Germans lost about 240,000 men and the British and French lost about 250,000 men. So I guess you could call that a victory um, when you're on a tiny percentage scale. But of course it wasn't because the whole purpose behind this was victory. It was the last chance. The, the Allies could replace these losses because the Americans were arriving. There would soon be a million American troops in France. So these were irreplaceable losses for the Germans. And it also was the case they were their best troops. These were the most motivated, highly trained. The qu average quality of the German army after the spring offensive was over, I would say, was significantly lower than it had been before. Because these weren't just a random assortment of troops. These were their best shock troops and they burned through them at a prodigious rate. So the cost to the Germans was much greater. And it's also interesting, you can see here, you always imagine that, oh, why didn't you just stay on the defensive in World War One? you know, because obviously the attackers would lose far more, many, far more men. But often it's not the case. If you really look at the statistics for many World War One battles, even the real bloodbaths, you'll see that the losses, whether you're attacking or defending, are, you know, fairly similar on both sides. The fight is in full swing. Very soon the units are mixed in the fog and command is difficult. The enemy very strongly defend themselves and we are struggling for hours and the losses grow. Many grenadiers are bleeding. The machine gunner Bona doesn't waver from the side of his leader, Lieutenant Cares, even though he is badly injured. Gradually, the first, second and third companies succeed in achieving their goal, the railway embankment. A special feature of this is Officer Cadet Harmon, of the first company, who, when the attack is about to falter, goes in front of his men to set an example, as well as Gertreiter, maybe Lance Corporal is a good equivalent, Gertreiter Freyer, likewise of this first company, who proves himself as the commander of a light machine gun. Likewise, with determination, Lieutenant Berger of the second company goes forth. He and Harmon are wounded. Now also, the fourth company, Lieutenant Ramus, could be relieved. They had advanced head-on against the station, but for the most part they had lost their direction and in the fog stormed into the village at the side of the station. The rest of the company had not been able to join them. Lieutenant Poch writes, I had been ordered to proceed with my platoon on a broad front in the direction of the railway facilities. At first there were only occasional shots, but mostly buzzed over us, and then the increasing rifle and machine gun fire is obviously targeted directly at us. And as we advance to the vicinity of the installations, we are very close to the still invisible enemy, and in that most unfavorable moment, the wall of fog ruptures, almost in no time. The March sun breaks through and gives our eyes a panorama of the village and the battle. About 300 meters ahead of us, the enemy sits in the best field position and opens a raging fire. Now, I again walked around this area of the battlefield on Google Maps, and what we are looking at here is what the British defenders would have been seeing. In fact, directly behind me in this position would be the uh, railway crossing and the, uh, you know, the railway line. So this is, I'm standing at the point which is pretty much the target of the German assault, and this is the field they're having to cross. So as long as there was thick fog, it was all very well and good. But you can imagine if you're 300 meters away from the British lines when the fog lifts and you're in that kind of flat terrain, you are in serious trouble. And the next photo is, I just went down that road and turned around and looked back at the village of Flavi. So this is probably about 300 meters away from the railway line. And this is what the Germans would have been looking at. So you're advancing in the thick fog. There are bullets buzzing around. Most of them are missing. Suddenly the fog lifts and... British machine gun and rifle fire is suddenly flaying you. 
individual grenades also hit, but do no significant damage. But we have to run 300 meters, and we leap for our lives. The terrain in front of us is completely smooth without any cover, with a good field of fire for the English. Since I no longer respect the courage of the enemy, I command again, jump on, march, march. Most grenadiers follow, but a raging fire hits us. The losses are high. We throw ourselves back, but since we are almost defenseless, I attempt to get myself a short distance to a small piece of cover five meters in front of me. Then I feel a heavy blow to my right hip joint, as if I were getting hit with a rifle butt, and I'm lying on the ground, bleeding. Then I roll on my back and watch to my horror as the enemy fires into my grenadiers, lying defenseless in the field. Some are hit several times. Now, this reminds me very much of what was going on with my great-uncle. I've mentioned before this was where I started getting interested in the battle for the Crozat Canal, and this is the assault that was happening at the same time, just a little bit further south, just next to the village of Jussi, and it was a different division. You can see there's the 30th Regiment, the 145th and the 67th German regiments that were assaulting the position held by a single battalion, the 11th Fusiliers. Uh, this is the point of the canal where my, um, just over there was where the 11th Fusiliers were happening. This is where the Germans were attacking. It's even on the same day as the battle, 23rd of March. There's the Germans preparing for their assault. There's some Germans waiting, getting ready for the assault the day before. And the reason this particular episode of the fog suddenly lifting and exposing them is the circumstances leading to capture. I haven't given you the whole thing, just the relevant part because he was with the 11th Fusiliers, Captain Percy, and the same thing that happened to the Germans happened to him. Here's what he said. I proceeded to HQ to report and to get small arms ammunition and bombs, of which we had run short. The dump only contained Lewis gun drums, which were full. Going forward, I dealt out ammunition, and taking runner and servant, went to investigate position on left from about 100 yards in rear of my line. While trying to reconnoiter the other side of slight ridge on my left, the mist suddenly cleared and we were spotted. I was shot in my belt and boot and then through the neck while running forward to regain my trench. Position now materially altered as Germans had excellent command from elevation in front. While being bandaged, Lieutenant Cruikshank crawled up trench getting his helmet riddled and reported critical situation on centre and right. Captain Brooklyn crawled from the right and reported we were nearly wiped out from enfilading fire from railway embankment along which the Germans were apparently advancing in force. We discussed possibility of fighting our way back even against orders as we were surrounded, but the shortage of ammunition rendered it impossible. Now, I think it's on the same day, so I would say, given the close proximity, the mist would have lifted at almost exactly the same time. So at the point of about 11 a.m., when the Germans are charging across that open field towards Flavie, and the, feet, the mist lifted, and they were suddenly exposed to mass fire, would it be... I think we can say within minutes, maybe exactly the same time, was the point where the mist lifted over the 11th Fusiliers, exposed Captain Percy, who was in the open, suddenly to German machine gun fire, and that was, I'm pretty confident, the exact point at which my great-uncle would have been killed when those Germans on the railway embankment on their right flank could shoot down into their one-foot-deep trenches and uh, that was the point he was shot through the head. So this particular moment is of critical importance to me in researching my family history and my whole interest in the Crozat Canal. Now let's get back to the attack on Flavie. This unfortunate situation is put to an end by the success of the other companies. Supported by their fire, the 4th now takes the station in a furious rush and the enemy skedaddle. Deputy Sergeant Manning shows exemplary bravery. Lieutenant Kyrie's comments describe this section of the fight. Under the pressure of the 1st and 3rd companies, the enemy gave way and, and our heavy machine guns could help the beleaguered comrades at the station with flanking fire. The gun of Corporal Nentwig, Nentwig was completely put out of action here. The platoon commander, Lieutenant Schleimer, was badly wounded. The crew of the gun were dead or wounded. Now the bottom right photo was actually some Germans that had been captured by British troops but they're being made to carry their own machine gun. So you can see the kind of weight that was involved. And, you know, those machine guns were not light. They had a, a crew of, um, well, I don't know, probably, well, that, you only see five in the photo, but I suspect their crew was born like six to eight, and they had to carry the ammunition, not to mention two men, just to lug that machine gun. Can you imagine trying to charge forward under enemy fire carrying something like that? 
even as the previously mentioned machine gunner Ho Heisel was seriously wounded. With two of the groups of the first company, so he reports, we took position. The groups directly on the railway embankment, our guns about 500 metres behind it, so that we could shoot over them. We had fired about a hundred bullets, and then I got shot through the arm. I jumped up and was hit by a second bullet that shattered my left leg. I fainted and lay for a long time exposed to this English fire until I was found after our attack by Comrade Hoffman and was picked up by a medic. The brave man had to have his leg amputated. Now back to the history of the Rifle Brigade. The attack was supported by artillery fire on our positions, directed at times by as many as seven German aeroplanes at once, which hovered above and fired very lights of signals. Light trench mortars were also employed with great accuracy, but the most effective support was given to the advancing infantry by machine guns, which did not stay behind and merely provide overhead fire, as seems to often be the role of our machine guns, but which were brought right forward with the forward advance patrols, and as soon as any piece of ground or part of a village was made good, the guns were mounted and caught our men as they fought the rearguard action. Whenever any of our men, wounded or otherwise, attempted to get back to new positions, a hail of bullets swept the forward slopes of the ground behind. As many as twelve machine guns would open from Flavy alone onto the northeast slopes of La Haute de Bois. Now this is actually really interesting, because... A lot of British machine gun battalions, they all, they actually fired their machine guns ballistically. Everybody sees World War One movies and it's all about guys with the machine guns on tripods going ba 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 as the Germans are charging. But actually the majority of rounds fired by the heavy machine guns were actually ballistic. They were used like light artillery. They would fire, you know, 2,000 yards away and they would rain down, literally rain down, like a bullet raindrops falling on German positions. And uh, and there were frequent complaints. In fact, the complaints of the brigadier who commanded the 54th Brigade, who the my great uncle's 11th Fusiliers were, was in that brigade. He complained bitterly how ineffective the British machine guns were for their refusal to come forward and actually actively engage. By contrast, and this will feature in future episodes when I get back to my New Zealand grandfather. Um, the day my grandfather was shot through the face, they were actually using, the, the New Zealand machine gunners were in, heavily engaged in a frontal assault. They were being used as shock weapons, rapidly advancing and deploying, along with the attacking New Zealand infantry, in exactly the manner that you hear the Germans described here. So, first off, don't just imagine it's just firing over the um, the tripod at Germans advancing, a lot of it's ballistic fire. Second, they were highly effective assault weapons. They weren't purely defensive. Okay, back to the story. Circumstances leading to capture this time of Robert Wilson, who was actually captured at Flavie Le Martel. He, had, he was in the 9th Rifle Brigade. He was another Scotsman. On the morning, oh, sorry, I can't do Scottish accent, sir. On the morning of the 23rd March 1918, my company were holding a position at Flavie Le Martel, south of Saint Quentin, France. The Bosch made a successful attack on our left, and by the time D Company got the got the enemy, was well round our flank. There was a perfect hail of machine gun bullets, and unfortunately, I was hit, sustaining compound fracture of right tibia and also severe wound in right thigh. I was totally incapacitated and unable to carry on. As all our troops had withdrawn, I was left on the field where I was wounded and was subsequently picked up by the enemy Red Cross men. Remember I told you that I have multiple accounts of the German Red Cross patching up and um, looking after wounded British? Don't think your idea of Nazi war atrocities here. They're, um, the German Red Cross were doing their best for all wounded men. Back to the Prussian Grenadiers. Parts of the 1st Battalion had strayed from the battle and got into the village. This is described by Sergeant Menzel of the 4th Company. We ran like weasels through the village. Just get through, I urged my men. Each squad leader wanted to be the first to reach the exit, and Sergeant Claris joined me with a light machine gun, so we had a certain amount of firepower. So we reach the exit of the village, and a shot comes from a cellar hole, and we see Lieutenant Bott of the 2nd Company collapsing. But for the moment, we cannot help him. First, we have to clear the basement. We reach the house, but the English will not come out when we shout. Hand grenades into the house. A terrible roar. Then one comes up, but with rifle in hand. He had to expect what he got, and he rolled dead down the stairs. That probably scared the others back. Now there was no more pause. Corporal Claris took all the basement windows under fire until it became quiet. Only now could we take care of Lieutenant Bott. 
but it was too late. Sergeant Menzel's account continues. We still had a homestead in front of us. We took it under fire with the machine gun, and at the same time I wanted to use my men against it. But the enemy hit us so hard that we had to limit ourselves first to keeping the homestead under machine gun fire. Finally, the fire of the enemy died down. Around this time, our company leader, Lieutenant Ramus, arrives at our position. He praises us. I am glad that my company has gone through the village so dashingly. I have NCOs whom I can rely on. He then went back through the village to collect his men, because already an English counter-attack was being threatened, so I covered the company as a rearguard. NCOs Klosa, Domka, Gangov, and many others were wounded. Fifteen Englishmen who suddenly appeared were captured without violence. We didn't neglect, by the way, despite all the heat of the fight, to pay a thorough visit to the English canteen. And that is a uh, English basic grocery supply depot, I think is the German, the translation of what you're reading under there. And in fact, I'll probably make an individual shorter episode about some of the the German descriptions when they captured um, English supply de- depots or depot. I've been living in the States now, I've learned to say, pronounce it depot. Um, they, uh, they were absolutely delighted. The German rations were pretty pathetic and uh, and they were missing all sorts of things. And they there's these vivid descriptions of them just gorging on bacon straight out of the supply things and, and the alcohol and just how amazed they were at how good the food was being fed to the English compared to what they had been getting. Sergeant Haim. The frontal attack 2nd Battalion had meanwhile overcome savage resistance at Savonois Chateau, then taken the railway embankment and was pushing further through Flavie. Sergeant Hain of the 8th Company reports, The fight lasted two hours, and the enemy was thrown back to the exit of the village, where they defended themselves again, and here a terrible house fight broke out. Through vigorous action by my company under Lieutenant Ishaka, and an M- a machine gun platoon under Lieutenant Schneider, the 2nd Machine Gun Company, all the officers with gun in hand, we managed to throw the enemy out of the village. The English suffered terrible losses. Few were taken prisoner. The enemy now flooded out of the village, again resisting harshly. Now, sometimes I've tried to identify these Germans, and sad to say it's a lot harder with the German records. Some of it is due to the fact of all the destruction of World War II. So many of the German military files were lost. Ironically, if they were Bavarian units, you often have better luck because the accident of the damage of war and so on meant that a lot of the Bavarian military files survive, but Prussian troops, ah, forget about it, you're not going to be able to get much. But I thought I might be able to succeed with this guy, Lieutenant Eschaka, I think it would be how you pronounce it, because it's quite a rare last name. And I had a look around and, well, sadly, no luck. I find a few, found a few individuals actually in the United States with that as their last name, but... No, I, I had no luck identifying who this particular lo- lo- Lieutenant Ishaka was. Now, Captain George Henry Fairbairn of the 9th Rifle Brigade. I know very little about him. I wish I knew more. Um, the re- only reason I came across his name was because he was given a medal for his actions at Flavie Le Martel on this day, for conspicuous gallantry and devotion to duty. When his commanding officer had become a casualty, he took charge of the battalion and proved himself a capable leader under the most trying circumstances. He held on to positions to the last moment, retiring last himself and rallying the remains of his battalion. Well, that's certainly what the Germans are describing, isn't it? Now, I've found very little about him. It even took a lot of time to find a photo, but eventually at the Imperial War Museum, I got one. Uh, I found that he had he was a Londoner. He joined initially with the 28th London Regiment, also known as the Artist Rifles, and was later promoted to be a, a second lieutenant in September of 1915. And uh, sad to say, that's all I've got about him. I wish I knew more. Now, back to a German account. Lieutenant Helmut Hoffmann. Another campaigner, Lieutenant Hoffmann, Helmut writes, Flavie was taken by storm and many a local compa- uh, many a loyal companion sank into the grass, spurring on his comrades by his death. The young Lieutenant Schneider stormed ahead of the 2nd Battalion. Now and then he stopped and fired at the fleeing Englishmen like in a hunt. No warning call could hold him back. His example had an excellent effect on his men, who were faithful to him from day one. Flavie had become a bloodbath for the English, a special tribute to our proud grenadiers. The leader of the battalion, Captain Reimer, who always at the head urged his followers forward, had a great part in it. Now the photo on the right says it's the grave of three officers 
who fell on the 24th. So this will be, the, well, we'll cover that battle as well, but German officers from this regiment who fell in this battle that lasted from 22nd, 23rd, 24th of March. Now, Captain Squire of the Rifle Brigade continues. Considering that the enemy consisted of fresh troops, probably practiced in open warfare, plentifully supplied with ammunition and greatly outnumbering our forces, and adding to this the fact that they had the support of artillery, light mortars, rifle grenades and machine guns, it was no disgrace that such a handful of men had to withdraw. The most that we could hope to do was to delay the enemy's advance so as to give time for the supports to come up behind. This we did. Sergeant Boughton was killed. An immense grief to me. He was a fine fellow. Rifleman Greenwell, A Company Lewis Gunner, did splendid work, wounded while staying to the last to give covering fire while the rest got back to the rear position. He's probably a prisoner. His only thought was of other people. He said to me when all the rest had gone, Don't stay, sir. Leave me and save yourself. I shall be all right. His leg was broken, and I thought it was my duty to go and rally the men in the next position. Now, I told you I like to find out about these individuals, so who was this Captain Squire? It's funny the things you find and the things you don't. Um, it's a bit random, frankly, but it was quite some interesting story about what he got up to. Post-World War I, he was referred to as the Reverend Captain Charles Edward Squire. So he was a clergyman, which is interesting because there was a major, major deacon in the 11th Fusiliers, who was also a minister and after the war went back to become a minister. You don't you think of clergymen, you know, being chaplains with the army, but you don't think of them as being combat troops. But they, well, many of them were indeed or became chaplains again after the war, well, ministers. So Charles Edward Squire or Reverend Captain Charles Edward Squire. And I found out that from 1924 to 1926, he was the principal of a fairly important college in the south of India in the state of Kerala. Uh, this college had actually been established very early, 1817, by the Church Missionary Society. And um, it was, I mean, when we say college, we're talking university level, for higher level education for local English people. So he was there from 1924 to 1926. And after that, he was actually um, brought across to Nigeria by the British colonial government to establish an elite boys' school. They described it as trying to have it on the same model as Eton in England to sort of raise young men in the, uh, you know, to, to be leaders of, of in, within Nigeria. And so he was transferred, um, and it refers, mentions that he was transferred from a school in India, although the dates don't 100% correspond. So perhaps from 26 to 29, he'd been at a different school in India. Again, as I said, some information's just not there. And uh, quite interesting that this school in Nigeria, this government college, Ibadan, which is usually referred to in Nigeria just as the GCI, but some of the notable alumni, many of whom probably would have been there when... Um, Charles Squire was the principal of this school. We have the uh, King of Benin. We have the first Chief Justice of Botswana. We have um, the first Nobel Laureate from Africa. And uh, we have a major politician, a Minister of Labour, the Nigerian Ambassador to the United Kingdom. The school had many other distinguished alumni, but I cut off the list there because they went to the school at a later date when Squire wouldn't have been there anymore. Okay, back to the battle. Now... The 8th Rifles, War Diary. Enemy open bombardment at 6am and advance in force on Flavie Station. 10am, Battalion withdraw to Flavie Petit de Trois Road with rear guard under Captain C.R. Barnes, DSO, MC, that's Military Cross, the two medals basically, in Flavie. Now, this area he's describing is there. You can see Flavie at the top of the map and the area they must be, be retreating to just south of Flavie is here with Petit de Trois. Now, if you're looking at there, you've got Detroit, it's Little Detroit. Here we have Detroit de Anois. And everybody knows the city named Detroit in the United States. I don't think there's that many people who are actually aware that Detroit is actually a French place name and that Detroit, well, is named after locations in France. I'm not sure which Detroit, to be honest. So this uh, Little Detroit, well, it wouldn't have been pronounced Detroit, of course. It would have been Detroit, I believe. But anyway, let's get back to the story. About 3 p.m., the enemy had worked round our flanks, making the withdrawal necessary. Withdrawal carried out under heavy machine gun fire. Withdrawal through French, 
he spelled French wrong, but never mind. Withdrawal through French on Cooney, Le, La Nouvelle Road, covered by good resistance of Major F. E. Young and Captain C. E. Squire. Now, this is, I mean, these descriptions aren't exactly precise, so you have to do your best to work out what he's talking about. Now, the French knew how desperate the situation was on in the British positions. The whole reason the Germans chose to attack here was it was the most southerly point of the British line. It was the joining... Well, I mentioned in the last episode that they were able to get across the canal in part because they attacked at the boundary between two different British divisions and they weren't covering that area nearly as well. And how much more would it be, well, poor cooperation, shall we say, at the boundary between two completely different armies, the French army and the British army. Now, the French, as I said, knew how desperate the situation was and did rush some troops up there. There were some dismounted dra um, dragoons and a few others, um, but it was desperate and panicked without preparation. The French troops were going up with literally just the ammunition they were carrying with them, so they did help slow the Germans down, but they rapidly ran out of ammunition and then they were... Well, they were in as bad a position as they as everybody else. So this is where I think the Eighth Rifles were retreating. And again, when we say that, they would have lost touch with so many men. At least the core that is being recorded in their war diary was probably heading in this direction. But so many of the other men, even the ones who weren't dead or wounded or prisoners, would have scattered and been heading in whatever direction they could. Now, Captain Charles Roper Gorrell Barnes is mentioned above as commanding the rear guard. And he was said to have done very well, and he survived this particular engagement. But not long afterwards, on April the 21st, he too was destined to die. And he was only 21 years old. Look how young he looks. Um, you hear these names, and particularly when you see all these movies, you always imagine these captains and as being you know, in their 30s or 40s, but many of them in 1920, 21. Um, he came from a distinguished family. His father had been a member of parliament from Kent. And the inscription on his gravestone says, Until the day break and the shadows flee away. At 12 noon, the regimental staff arrives at the north entrance to the village. Nearby, at the cemetery, a large number of captive Englishmen await their exodus. And these, by the way, are British troops who are pr German prisoners in this offensive. Not at Flavie. I couldn't find any photos from Flavie, but it's during the spring offensive within one or two days of the action I'm describing. Flavie still receives German artillery fire, as the liaison officer, Lieutenant Ecker, has no communications to stop it. So, friendly fire, the German artillery hasn't got the news that the Germans have already taken Flavie. The regiment now receives a new command from the division. It is to head to Bellu, five to six kilometers southwest of Flavie. You can see there Flavie on the top right. Where the Germans are advancing um, from the canal and they'll be heading towards Anois. Um, now they've been told their next target for the offensive is Benoit, which is, uh, well, down there on the bottom left. Oh, sorry, not Benoit, Bellu. The battalion arrange themselves for the new attack. The Fusilier battalion has also come up. Some hundred metres in front of the railway embankment, we receive fire, reports Lieutenant Kraft, and Sergeant Gusser is severely wounded. We again continue towards Flavi. The battalion follows the first and second, which advances against Anois and Cuny, two kilometres west of Flavi. Anois is taken quickly. So you see, Flavi, Le Martel and Anois are so close together, they're almost, but not quite, one village. So Anois is taken quickly, not so Cuny. There's going to be a major fight for Cooney. Now, Robert Wilson. I wanted to finish the um, story of capturing Flavy before I returned to Robert Wilson, who I quoted from his circumstances leading to capture. He was wounded and captured in Flavy because he had an interesting background as well. He was the other Scotsman who said he wanted to serve in a Scottish regiment when he was promoted and who the army utterly ignored. He wanted to join a particular one, the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders. Um, like Robert Fife Smith had said, any Highland regiment, the army ignored them both and put them in the rifle brigade. So he was a little older, 1886, than your average soldier. Um, interesting other backgrounds. You know, his father was a nurseryman and florist. 
He himself was a law clerk, and his military file even contained a recommendation from his former employer, who was solicitor and town clerk of Helensburgh. Now, Helensburgh in Scotland is quite close to Loch Lomond, and if you know the song, um, you take the high road and I'll take the low road, and I'll be in Scotland before you, but me and my true love shall never meet again on the bonny, bonny banks of Loch Lomond. Well, anyway, if you just go a, a very short distance southwest of Loch Lomond, you'll get to Helensburgh. And here's the recommendation. I found him active, intelligent, and painstaking. Painstaking. And latterly, he took charge of important duties, both in, on behalf of the town council of Helensburgh and on my firm's behalf. I may add that Lance Corporal Wilson bears an excellent moral character and has been a lifelong abstainer. He was a teetotaler, in other words, didn't drink alcohol. And after he was captured, I found two inquiries with the International um, Swiss Red Cross. So on the left, we have a um, sister who's asked about him, Miss Bessie Wilson. Well, Robert Wilson, Bessie Wilson, brother and sister. So it makes sense. And you can ha see there they didn't find out until June. It took a while for the news to trickle through to the Swiss. Captured in March, the news doesn't get through till June. So according to letter, in J 6th of June is a prisoner. And they mention the prison camp, etc. Now what I found interesting was the second inquiry because it was a Miss Alice Willens from the hydropathic Shandon Dumbartonshire. Now, at first I thought the address was kind of interesting, and I looked it up, and the hydropathic was kind of like this resort with, you know, you do swimming and physical activity, and, um, and I, I actually read some interesting stuff about it, and then I decided that rabbit hole was too deep and too much of a digression, so I left it aside. I'm guessing she was an employee there at the time. And then I wondered, who was this um, this Alice Willens? Was she a girlfriend? What was she? And I think she must have been, because um, I went searching around, in this case on Ancestry, just by pure luck, I found somebody's family tree. You know, people make their own family trees on Ancestry. And um, I even actually sent them a message and asked them. And this, these were just distant relatives of theirs that they didn't really know anything about, sadly enough. But it did show that a certain Alice Willens on that family tree had married a Robert Wilson. So there you go. She was a girlfriend, and indeed they did get married. Now, I couldn't work out exactly when they got married, but my guess is shortly after he returned from being a prisoner, so, you know, maybe January of 1919, when well, my own grandfather, New Zealand grandfather, married in London on the 1st of January 1919. And, you know, I guess, you know, her poor, wounded husband who she had to nurse back to health and his military file describes him at this time as being debilitated and nervous and he's lost weight so he certainly needed Ellis to look after him and this photo by the way is just when I was on um, holiday in Scotland we were in this village not far from the Isle of Skye and just by pure chance a wedding party walked up the street so we just madly snapped photos and uh, yeah, so that wasn't posed or anything I found on the internet. That was just some random wedding that I happened to, um, well, stumble on or they walked up to me while I was sightseeing in Scotland. And, um, and some more things from Robert Wilson's file. This is the British Medical Board. The board find that this officer was wounded by two machine gun bullets, um, which were T and T through and through, I, in other words, the bullets pass straight through. One lower one-third of thigh in front of the femur, um, no fracture. The second, the lower one-third of tibia, causing compound fraction of junction of upper and lower one-third. He was dressed by Germans five hours after wound and left in the field for three hours when he was taken prisoner and received first dressing after field one and was admitted to hospital. This is very common. Remember I said it's always schnell, 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 fast, fast, fast. Don't stop to take prisoners. So the German Red Cross will stop. They'll patch him up, put bandages on him, and then just keep going, leaving him unsupervised on the field. Only the follow-up waves eventually take charge of so many of the prisoners. This was typical of so many British prisoners. Just, okay, you've been captured, put down your guns, walk to the rear, somebody else will look after you. Or in this case, he's too wounded, he can't walk, so just lie there and wait, somebody will take charge of you in due course. So, five hours after he gets bandaged up by the German Red Cross, he's, he's um, then taken prisoner. And he gets another dressing then. Uh, he was admitted to hospital April the 4th. 
About one week later, the leg from his hip to toes was encased in plaster of Paris. This was removed eight weeks later, and he had an operation. Yet the Germans really were looking after, as best they could under the circumstances, the, uh, the medical problems of the prisoners who they who they'd taken in this battle. And then on a letter dated 22nd, 27th December 1918, this is just after he's got back uh, from Germany, having been a prisoner. I was picked up by the enemy and transported to Germany and was a prisoner till I was repatriated. I have been continuously in hospital since. First in um, Restadt Lazarette, second Heilbrunn a Necker. I'm, I'm not sure what the res stands for in that context. Um, Württemberg and thereafter, uh, thereafter, I'm to keep forgetting stupid, no more German accent. Württemberg and thereafter Lazarette Russenlager Rastatt Baden. And I managed to find some photos from the, uh, the German hospital at Rastatt. And you can see here there's an ambulance train and they're taking off some wounded. They had German prisoners, there, I mean German patients there, but they also had British patients as well. Since arrival in England, I've been a patient at the Prince of Wales Hospital, Marylebone Road, London, and now at the above address in Glasgow. So uh, apparently that was not a particularly happy hospital. And when they had the uh, Spanish flu epidemic, there were complaints that they were putting men who were infected with the flu in the same rooms with you know men who were wounded for other reasons. And this was causing a spread of infections. Uh, yes, that's a lesson we learned a long time ago, but somehow when COVID broke out, uh, places like New York and New Jersey and a few others, I, I, I don't know how people could fail to learn that lesson, but they did. Then more proceedings of the medical board, July 1919. Wounds are soundly healed. There is some wasting of muscles in the affected leg. Walks by aid of stick and has swelling of ankle by the evening. Leg weak and becomes tired on exertion. There is inability to completely flex and extend leg. There is slight impairment of sensation in lower and inner half of leg. Complains of lack of spring in foot. No deformity. Like, again, it's so easy when you read these war narratives. A guy gets wounded. No, well, okay, he gets better. Like, I know just when I had a minor break in my ankle, just how long it took to get back the full use and how long it took before it didn't hurt anymore. And that was far more mild than having, um, you know, couple of machine gun bullets passed through my body, one smashing my leg bone on the way through in multiple places. Uh, far, far worse. It, it wasn't a matter of weeks for them to get better. The effects of this could last for years, often permanently. And rather than show you some gruesome photo of some um, nasty bullet wounds, I took a photo from my vacation in Scotland. Uh, and what is it? Well, it's a giant thistle flower. The thing was huge. It was about half the size of my fist. No, not cheap. Not bad. Three, three quarters of the size of, size of my fist. Absolutely huge thistle flower. Now, I have to feel so sorry for Robert Wilson because there's nothing I find more f infuriating than dealing with stupid bureaucrats or banks or insurance companies, you know, the kind of thing I'm talking about. Just, they've made a mistake and trying to get them to fix it just takes so much pointless, needless back and forth where all you need is somebody to take responsibility and fix what is obviously a mistake. And Robert Wilson had to deal with this through all of 1919. Um, and I think eventually it was resolved in January of 1920, because this is the last letter in his file dealing with it. Now, I'm not going to share all the other letters because there's so many letters back and forth. Um, I really feel sorry for Robert Wilson, what he had to go through. But the final letter in the, in the chain kind of gives you a sense of what he'd been going through. So here is a letter written from the War Office to the Ministry of Pensions. Robert Wilson was awarded a wound gratuity of £250 on the 16th of April 1919, but through error the money appears to have been paid to another officer of similar name on the 6th of May 1919. So in other words, if you had a serious wound like this, the British Army was supposed to pay you money, a wound gratuity. Now £250 would be a, a fairly large amount of money. It would have been you know, perhaps an annual wage for a labourer, so we're talking a good amount of money, and they made a mess up. They didn't pay it to Robert Wilson at all. They paid it to a different Wilson, a different R. Wilson. So Robert knows he's supposed to get his money and knows he hasn't got his money. 
several letters on the subject have passed between the War Office, also the Assistant Paymaster General, and on the 9th December I was informed by the Assistant Paymaster General that the matter had been referred to you some time previously, and a further reminder on the subject had been forwarded that day. So again, bureaucratic passing the buck. There were... They were going back, well, it's not our problem, it's the uh, Paymaster General's problem. No, no, it's not our problem, it's the uh, Ministry of Pensions' problems. No, no, it's the War Office's problem. Nobody willing to just take charge and fix the damn problem. The officer writes with great bitterness on the 18th of January, stating he has not received either the money or any communication on the subject from the War Office or the Paymaster General, and he emphasises the fact that he is in very urgent need of the money. I shall be grateful on his behalf for your personal intervention with a view to the gratuity being paid to him forthwith. Um, and seriously, I've, I've read all of the letters that Robert Wilson wrote, and you can just see the frustration and anger. Like, the poor guy, he, he knows he's owed the money. He knows the mistake was not his. They, the, what happened is so obvious, and yet he just can't get anybody to fix the damn problem. It was actually a Ralph Wilson who got the money. I'm sure Ralph Wilson was happy. Like, okay, they gave me £250. Well, yay, yay me. Um, I wonder if there was a whole other path of the bureaucracy, the, you know, that inertia of bureaucracy eventually going after Ralph Wilson to try to get the £250 back. Well, that I don't know. Now let's get back to the battle. This is from the history of the Somerset Light Infantry. At dawn on the 23rd, the two companies on the canal bank reported the presence of German patrols in St. Simon. So a bit of a recap here. As soon as the sun rose, the fog became worse, and now it was possible to see only just across the canal. At 8am, battalion headquarters were ordered back to Anwar in order to be in close touch with the brigade. On reaching the railway, battalion headquarters came in touch with some men of the 14th Division who said that the charges beneath the bridge of Jussi had failed to explode and that the Germans were across and were then coming down the railway. The only company of the battalion then in touch with the battalion headquarters was A., under Captain McMurtry, which was ordered to form a defensive flank from headquarters to the three companies along the canal bank. But the marshy ground effectively prevented this order being carried out, though A Company managed to keep in touch with headquarters. So I've shown you this picture before just to show you how swampy it was behind the canal that they were trying to defend, so you can see why A Company couldn't get through. And this then brings us to the account of McMurtry, who was in charge of A Company, still in touch the only company in the battalion of the Somerset Light Infantry, still in touch with battalion headquarters. And uh, when I'm in London next time, I definitely am going to try and get his private diary, which I do not have access to as yet, from the Imperial War Museum. And it also covers some of his time at Rushtat and Gardens, which I'm also very interested in. And he lived to a ripe old age of 95. So here's what he had to say. We started to go across country in artillery formation. Soon, however, Lieutenant Berry came rushing up to tell me that he had made a mistake, that we were to get back. We got back just as the enemy began to fire with heavy machine guns, and soon I got a message from the commanding officer to form a defensive flank against the enemy who were expected to attack by an encircling movement at any moment. We soon saw some men on the horizon, but it was impossible to make out whether they were Germans or our own men. The machine gun fire was pretty hot, and these men began running, and at last reached us. They were men of the KRRC, the King's Royal Rifle Corps, who had been fighting on the canal bank. Now, remember I said there were fragments of units all over the place? The um, Some of the battalions of the King's Royal Rifle Corps were in the front line when the Germans came, and were so utterly smashed that we don't even have war diaries for them. They were they completely disintegrated. The men of the uh, the KRRC who were on the canal would have been the fragmentary survivors who had managed to get away from that disaster. But they, I mean, you can imagine their morale would have been shattered already, having the front line broken, their battalion utterly destroyed, and they were just the stragglers who managed to get back. Back to McMurtry. McMurtry went back. Oh, so this is not his quote, but he goes back. He he gets back to Battalion HQ because that they're, they're having signalers with flags and things that are supposed to pass messages or maybe w run wireless cables but of course none of that can work in the uh, the weather conditions and the um, time constraints so he heads back to his own company i'd gone halfway and was just crossing a very marshy piece of ground when the enemy started shelling heavily machine gun and rifle fire increased and then i saw the remainder of my company headed by an officer running back as fast as they could in terror men dropping in all directions it was impossible to form up the remainder in the swamp, so I led them over to battalion headquarters. Here I found that the enemy had advanced and was pushing forward his machine guns to try and encircle us. 
Now to give you a recap of where we are. So the 7th Somersets are trying to defend this section of the canal just next to St. Simon. The, uh, the breakthrough has happened at Kamar Wood, that little semicircular, semicircular clearing roughly, a little bit further down where the Rifle Brigade was supposed to be holding them and failed. Um, their battalion headquarters is at Anwar, that's just a little bit northwest of Flavi. Now, they mentioned some men of the 14th Division retreating, so they must have come from that direction, from the village of Jussi. Now, Foley, Foley, who I've quoted extensively, was in charge of D Company. So the Germans have seized Jussi, and A Company is somewhere in that vicinity. So they're trying to get in touch with their troops on the canal, and they're also trying to protect against a flanking attack. So I imagine that must have been roughly where they were deployed. And then that's where they would have been when McMurtry went to try to get back in touch with battalion headquarters. And that's where they would have been thrown back in confusion. At least that's my best understanding of the description. Now, the end came quickly. Rifle and machine gun fire had suddenly become intense and casualties were heavy. This is at the battalion headquarters in Anwar. Acting Adjutant Lieutenant Berry fell dead. That's Samuel George Berry, he was. He was 42 years old when he died. Lieutenant Colonel Troy Bullock was severely wounded, shot through the neck, whereupon Captain McMurtry took command of battalion headquarters as well as the survivors of his own company. Now, Captain McMurtry, again, you hear that name and I'm sure you're imagining some distinguished-looking British officer. McMurtry was 19 years old and suddenly he finds himself in charge of in theory, of the whole battalion. Well, they don't know where three of their companies are, so it's really just a quarter of the battalion, but he's got battalion HQ. He's in charge, as far as he knows. The three companies on the canal bank were completely cut off and surrounded, and fighting all the way back, Captain McMurtry and his party fell back onto the 7th um, Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry, who had taken up a position some 2,000 yards west of the Noir, north and south of the railway. From this position, however, it was evident a further retirement would have to be made, for by 6pm the enemy had captured Okor and Vrushi, both in the rear of the 7th Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry. Well, you can see they have quite a similar um, badge to the um, Somerset Light Infantry, and uh, there's a recruiting poster for them, a good and healthy sporting life. Well, it sure as heck wasn't good and healthy um, th these days in March of 1918. And... Uh, I found the um, documentation on the Commonwealth War Grave site for the burial of this Lieutenant Barry. And it's interesting because this one actually gives you some clues about how he's identified. You can see here, means of identification, officer's car key, piece of tunic cuff with one cloth star attached, regimental buttons. Well, that's not a lot to go on. You can tell which regiment he belonged to, so that would be enough to bring it down to 7th Somerset Light Infantry, because at least you'd know which battalion was deployed in this position. Um, I guess it was a process of elimination. That really doesn't seem to be a lot to identify it as Lieutenant Barry, but they did in due course identify him, and then he was... Well, this is a concentration report. Remember I said that they would uh, dig up a lot of the bodies and then put them in concentrated Commonwealth war graves, um, cemeteries where they could be properly cared for. So roughly, this is what I think is going on. So we've told that the Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry were back in the vicinity of Olazi Okor, about 2,000 yards west of Anhua. And then you can see where the Somerset Light Infantry headquarters and A Company were at Anhua. So they retreat back, or well, the survivors do at least, to roughly the position where the, uh, the headquarters of the DCLI are. Now, they mention here that the Germans were in Ocourt and Bruchy. Now, I find this a bit hard to believe at this point in the battle. They would have advanced so rapidly and flanked them so quickly. I suspect if there were Germans there, they were at best maybe cavalry scouts. The Germans would not yet have been in these positions in any strength. And, um, and of course, the, we've already heard that the Germans rapidly took Anhua. That's where uh, Colonel Troit Bullock was um, badly wounded and uh, Lieutenant Berry was killed and so on and so on. Now, they mentioned that they cleared Ocor of the Germans. And again, as I said, they, well, they may well have done it, but I doubt there were very many Germans there, possibly just some 
cavalry scouts or something along those lines. Now back to McMurtry and on the right you can see just I mean they're marked on the maps you imagine big towns you can see here from the Google satellite view that Okor is just a tiny little village and Olazi is only just a little bit bigger and the area there is very open countryside this line running down here is actually the railway line which is the point where the Germans had been assaulting a little bit further to the east at Flavi also of interest here you can see this is the border between Ain and Somme so this is really on the boundary between well very close to the Somme okay back to McMurtry's account Huns attacked us and for about an hour we kept shooting at them and kept them at bay Lieutenant Barry, who was next to me firing away, got up to look over the bank over which we were shooting. He got a bullet right through the head and was killed instantly, falling on top of me with a groan. Barry was one of the best and kindest men I've ever come across. I was very upset to see him killed. I now had to take command of the battalion headquarters. Ammunition was giving out, and the Germans were gradually working around us and threatening to surround us at any minute. I considered it would be a waste of life to hold on any longer, having done all we could to delay the enemy for as long as possible. A great many men had already been killed or wounded, and I decided that it was time to withdraw. Ammunition. Oh, sorry, this is not a quote anymore. This is just my summary of events. So they're running out of ammunition, and they're already back with the Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry at this point. And... The Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry decide it's time to get out of there, and they give the fabulous job of being the rear guard to hold the Germans off a bit longer while they withdraw to Captain McMurtry's men, who are already from a shattered battalion, perhaps not the best ones to leave behind, but anyway. Um, so they are now the rear guard, told to hang on as long as they can to give the rest of the British troops time to withdraw. Um, and, oh no, this is, yeah, this is from the history of the Somerset Light Infantry. So, ammunition began to run out and a retirement was ordered. Captain McMurtry's party was ordered to form part of the rear guard and hang on as long as possible to the position. So well did these gallant fellows carry out their orders that when the time came for them to fall back, they found themselves completely surrounded and cut off and Captain McMurtry and about nine survivors were captured by the enemy. And this is a picture of Germans escorting captured British troops in the, um, this March spring offensive. On March the 24th, his own account of how he got captured. Almost immediately, the rest started withdrawing, and after they got clear, I gave the order to, that we should withdraw too. I had learned a lesson from Cambrai, and I was determined not to let the men start running, for once they did in such a situation, it was impossible to hold them. I had my revolver out, and anyone who tried to run, I immediately threatened to shoot. This stopped all the running, but it was the worst hour I've ever been through. The enemy were lining the ridge and pouring a deadly fire into us. Shells and shrapnel were bursting everywhere. German aeroplanes started flying over us and firing into our midst. Men were dropping everywhere. Some were wounded and calling out for help. Others were dying and groaning in their pain. So that's the point where they're defending, and basically they get completely overwhelmed by the German assault. And that is the end of the headquarters of the, uh, of the 7th Somerset Light Infantry. The end was very near, and soon we ran bang into a huge number of German artillery and transport and were captured. This is still McMurtry. A German on a horse came up and led me to believe that he wanted my revolver and kit, and so I gave him my revolver. He took it and fired it into the ground. I had heard, as everyone else had, of the awful treatment by Germans of their prisoners, and so thought this German was trying my revolver in order to shoot me. I waited, but nothing happened. I was told to take the rest of my kit off, and then, being very thirsty, got my water bottle out, filled it from a stream, and at last got a drink. The first one for 24 hours. After capture, an officer and some men came up to us. The officer spoke English and was quite friendly, and among other things asked me my rank and age. The German could not believe that an officer of 19 could be a captain, but I believe a captain in the German army has a larger body of men to command. So, this is not all of the 7th Somerset Light Infantry. Remember I said before that in these retreats, the battalions get shattered and the men are just retreating where they can. There's some cohesion here and there, but by no means does the battalion stay in one place. So, the headquarters is retreated up the railway line. But what about Foley with his, uh, his own company who'd been on the canal? <clears throat> 
Now, according to his description, they had retreated to the railway line. They were trying to get in touch with their headquarters. And it, once they got to the railway line, they, he had turned left to go to Anwar, where he thought that his headquarters were. But by the time he got there, in fact, headquarters was already gone and the Germans already were in possession of Anwar. Um, so what were they going to do? There's a company of the 7th Somerset Light Infantry still form together but they don't have touch with the rest of their battalion well we'll find out more about that later back to the prussians the englishman shows himself as a master of retreat amazing in his ability to adapt to the terrain english snipers with quick loading rifles are tenaciously defending the houses on the road to cooney performing their task of blocking them brilliantly the regimental staff is in the front line we have to wait until our mortars our minenwerfers make a clearing Brave work by our machine guns keeps the enemy under fire who tries to retire on the right and left of the road to the protection of Hill 74. Behind them, the enemy sets himself ready to offer more resistance and the fire of his artillery revives, while the absence of ours, which has not yet come across the canal, is very much felt. Thus, Lieutenant Eggers characterizes the situation in front of Cooney in the afternoon. It's actually both sides um, on different occasions complain that their own artillery isn't supporting them, but the enemy artillery are, is doing brilliant work. So both sides have that complaint, on, complaint at different occasions. Major Gustav sends him forward to vigorously bring forward the riflemen's lines, which are strongly set back on the right. It succeeds. The skirmish line is charging forward, but I get shot in the thigh, which throws me to the ground. Cooney must be taken no matter what. That was the order. But we do not succeed. The enemy defends himself desperately and the attack area offers no cover. Although parts of the 398th Infantry Regiment are used, we still do not succeed in conquering the village. Only when incoming artillery has vigorously prepared the attack do we win. Already at dusk, the 2nd Battalion of the 6th Grenadiers use the terrain and close on Cooney. Some sniping through trees and bushes and soon its companies invade the place. That means it's time for the 1st Battalion to fix bayonets and charge. In the melee, the enemy is expelled from the northern edge of Cooney. The goal is reached. Some hundred prisoners are taken. Parts of the Fusilier Battalion had also been used. Lieutenant Kraft writes, I spread out the company and finally deploy everybody. Unfortunately, I have to complain about the losses we suffered. And also, NCO Zimmerman has fallen a rider of the first mounted rifles, and the devoted private Klinger, the go-getter of the 21st, is very seriously wounded. In fact, the elimination of the defences at Cooney had brought heavy losses. Since the connection with the right-flanking 36th Infantry Division had been lost, Lieutenant Perdelwitz of the 3rd Company took the job of restoring the connection. He did not return and is considered to be dead, as well as the also missing Lieutenant Schulter of the company. Lieutenant Mangelsdorf wrote, so, no, he didn't write this, sorry. Anyway, this is a description of Lieutenant Mangelsdorf, who was the first to storm the enemy trenches, and Lieutenant Engel, who was wounded, were particularly noteworthy in the attack on Cooney, among many others. In addition, Officer Cadet Zeilmeyer, who had already distinguished himself at Flavy, was wounded three times in front of Cooney. Then Sergeant Schendel, who, according to the words of an entry, paved the way for the Fusiliers to attack with his machine gun fire. Both belonged to the 1st Machine Gun Company. Excellent service was also given by Gefreiter Newman of the 6th Company of Vice Sergeant Levin. He carried his men along with him despite fierce resistance and was seriously wounded. So again, this is to recap what's going on. They've gone. They've come back, thought, what the heck do we do now? The Germans are there. And so they head down towards Cooney. You see at the very bottom of the map on the bottom left, there's Cooney. So that's where that company of the 7th Somerset Light Infantry is going to end up in a different position and out of connection with the rest of their battalion. Now we're back to the account of Foley. As I've said, Foley has got back to Cooney and joined up with a different battalion that he found down there from the same division as him, the 12th King's Liverpools. By now the overwhelming nature of the catastrophe had come home to us. That anything like the swift overpowering onslaught could happen had seemed incredible. Here were the Germans, 12 miles inside our lines in three days. Remember, this is World War I, where normally you think capturing 100 metres is a good day's work. A sense of calamity filled us, but no feeling of despair. Behind us, we thought, in our ignorance, there must be many troops in position. For ourselves, the situation seemed pretty grave. 
We were only an isolated force made up on a dozen different of a different excuse me. We were only an isolated force made up of a dozen different units and strength. I should say not more than two hundred. So again, the the histories will say, ah, yes, it was the twelfth Liverpool's or it was the seventh Somerset Light Infantry, but in reality, the unit cohesion had been completely shattered, and every organized body of men were just conglomerations of multiple different battalions. Now, from the war diary of the 12th King's Liverpools, we can actually really accurately plot where they were. Well, we're assuming that the war diary was able to give us true information, but thanks to it providing coordinates and us having these trench maps from the National Library of Scotland, we can place them at least exactly according to the way the war diary described them. So, on the 23rd to the 24th of March, ordered to move at once as follows. One company to garrison the keep R15 Central. Now to describe how it goes, that you can't see it on the side. Oh, you can. Top right, you can see this section of the map is R. And there's different numbers you can use to plot it. So we know that this box here is box 15. And then Central is in the right. And you can even see on this map, you can see there's a bunch of trenches. And they were called keeps. This is something that a lot of people misunderstand about the British positions, even the front line in this sector of the front. They were so short of men that they did not have a continuously manned trench line. Like you always imagine World War One, you know, there's a front line trench that goes all the way north and south. And then there's a second line trench that goes all the way. Now, they had communication trenches, but what they had actually decided to do tactically at this point was to concentrate most of their defences in keeps, which had a really good field of fire. This was actually a critical failure in the initial German assault on the 21st of the front line, even if they hadn't been shattered by artillery already, because the mist was so heavy, a lot of German units were actually able to penetrate through the British front line, because it wasn't continuous, it was centered around these keeps and so you have this fortified well dug in you know with dugouts and multiple trenches and so this is not quite what people normally imagine when they think about world war one it but this method of defense will i'll probably make an episode about this on a future occasion centers around keeps so that's what he's describing they were in a keep at the center of this box box 15 and you can actually see beneath the points where I put these units, you can actually see these trench lines are even marked out. So then we have, so one company to the keep in R15A 8.8. .8. Now, again, just to help you to understand how these map coordinates work, each one of these boxes has four smaller boxes inside it. The top left is A, the top right is B, the bottom left is C, the bottom right is D. So if, it, if they're in, you know, the center of box R15A, they'll be in the center of this box. If they're in the center of box R15D, well, maybe they would be in, say, that little trench line there, for example. So that's how we can place them. And rather than bore you reading out all the other coordinates, from that we can tell they had another company um, deployed somewhere along here in these trees, and another one that was just a little bit north of Cooney on this uh, crossroads there. Now, it's much harder to place exactly where the 7th Somerset Light Infantry are. Remember, this is the, just Foley's company, D Company. Um, but they're described as being on the right, just a little bit outside of Cooney. So I'm thinking that that's probably where they were in relation to these very precise coordinates that were given for the Liverpools. And to place where the um, headquarters had retreated to with the Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry, well, they're up there south of Olesey on the railway line. Now, Foley in 1920. It was extraordinary at times like that how any form body of men under proper control, however small it might be, seemed to attract to it the stragglers from miles around. In an incredibly short time, the banks of our sunken road were thick with men, belonging, I suppose, to a dozen different brigades. And here we have some English, some Scotsmen, and I think a Frenchman. Uh, this one actually comes from a German military hospital where Robert Wilson was sent. But it was quite hard to get photos of, you know, British troops of mixed units. So this was the best I could do. So that um, crescent that I put there, that's roughly the position being held by the Liverpools. And the cross is roughly the position being held by Foley's D Company of the Somerset Light Infantry. And now we turn to an account that was written by Lieutenant 
Colonel McCarthy O'Leary of the Royal Irish Rifles. Now, it's attached to their war diary, but it's a three-page summary that he must have written afterwards to describe this battle in particular. The morning of the 23rd of March, shortly after midday, both the 1st and 2nd Battalions were ordered to Cooney. The 2nd Battalion, Royal Irish Rifles, proceeded to occupy a defensive position east and northeast of the village astride the Cooney Flavi Le Martel Road. Another battalion belonging, I thought, to the 14th Division were on their right, prolonging the position southwards. So, again, trying my best to place them, we have the 2nd Battalion, Royal Irish Rifles, who are just to the east of Cooney on the road to Flavi Le Martel, so that's pretty close to where they must have been. Then we have this unknown battalion belonging to the 14th Division. They were the ones who had been holding the uh, village of Jussi and so on, but he can't even identify who they are. Then the 1st Battalion, Royal Irish Rifles, under my command, were held in readiness on the high ground south of Cooney in Square R25. Well, actually I've put it in the wrong box, haven't I? I put it in 26. So they were actually off to the left. They were one box further to the left. Um, I don't know how I made that mistake. I think the 26 was kind of hard to read when I was making it before, so I've put them in the wrong place. They were one box further to the west. During the afternoon, large bodies of Germans were observed collecting under trees in square R, 27B and D. So you can see I put the, where the Germans are advancing through the trees. I guess they've got good cover there. You can see very clearly if you go a bit further north, it's open country where they would get mowed down without any protection from the mist. The 1st Battalion had by this time occupied a position which I had selected. To the best of my recollection, it was about 3.45pm that the enemy's advance commenced. Now the 14th Division, who were those unknown men? Well, I actually turned to the official history there, and the official history names them as the 13th Entrenching Battalion. Uh, they were not exactly frontline troops. Their job was basically just to dig trenches with shovels and all the rest. Uh, they were not expected to undertake combat duties. They would never have been put in the front front line other than maybe to, you know, crawl out and lay some barbed wire or something. So it's perhaps not surprising that they didn't do particularly well in this battle. So, this German attack was preceded by an intense machine gun bombardment which continued until the light began to fail. About 4.30pm, large numbers of men belonging to the battalion in front, to which I referred, commenced a somewhat disorderly withdrawal through the left of my battalion. I went forward to find out what was happening and met the colonel of this battalion being carried back on a stretcher in dying condition. His men were now retiring hastily. So, I've tried to plot that out for you. So that entrenching battalion hasn't done very well when it comes under the assault of these German stormtroopers, and their colonel is mortally wounded. So that's where we are. It was now dusk and getting dark quickly. The noise of musketry and German shouting and cheering was great. They had broken through on my left front, there being no troops left there to stop them, and were firing at us in enfilade at short range. So the Germans had managed to advance in the gap that's been opened by the retreat of the entrenching battalion. Shortly afterwards, they charged us from the front and left. They were in superior numbers, and we were overrun. In the turmoil, I was hit and knocked down. I shouted to all I saw to retire south along the road. A few hundred yards back, I was able to collect the majority of the battalion. I then decided to withdraw to the next high ground, which was in the vicinity of Belou. So, as far as I can tell, the second Royal Rifles are retreating into Cooney, perhaps a little bit to the west. The first Royal Irish Rifles are retreating down the road back towards Belou, which is just a little bit off the map down there. And the Germans, meanwhile, are pouring into any gaps that are available. And then a further quote here. Colonel McCarthy O'Leary sent forward messengers with orders for the 2nd Battalion to withdraw through the 1st. No answer was received, and runners being all killed or wounded. In any case, Captain Bryans had orders to fight to the last, and had, moreover, come to the conclusion that an attempt to retire over open ground with machine guns on either flank would mean annihilation. So that's what I think's happened. They've retreated perhaps as far as the village and realized that there's just open open ground behind the village. If they try to go down that road with the Germans in the village, they're just going to get absolutely obliterated by the German machine guns. If his little force was to be destroyed, it should die to better purpose. There cannot be many instances, even in the late war, of a battalion being blotted out so completely as this. Only the transport, a handful of employed with it, 
A few officers kept back and those on leave were left. And if the incident was exceptional in this respect. So the second Royal Irish Rifles effectively ceased to exist at this point. Um, Oh yeah, the Duke of Cornwall's are gone. The Liverpools, I believe, retreat back behind Cooney along with those remnants from Foley's Somersets. And the Germans have now taken the position north of Cooney and they completely overwhelm the second Royal Irish Rifles. Now the war diary of the Irish Rifles, the second one. These are the guys who get destroyed. March 23rd, 10 a.m. A defensive position northeast of the village was taken up. The remnant of D Company reduced to 40 other ranks and no officers after a failed attack a couple of days earlier. Together with reinforcements under the command of Lieutenant Boyle, who rejoined the battalion that morning, were in reserve northwest of the village. 12 noon, reports were received that enemy patrols of cavalry had entered Flavie Le Martel and brigade orders directed that Cooney was to be held at all costs. With the exception of one or two minor attacks, the afternoon passed quietly. Hostile aeroplanes were, however, very much in evidence. And these are German fighters that I found photos of on the New Zealand National Army Museum. Obviously, they're captured German fighters, but, um, the, uh, but I think they gave very good views of German World War aircraft. I love that New Zealand soldier who's in the middle of the top photo. He seems to be staring at the wing going, what on earth is that all about? Anyway, 6 p.m. The enemy attacked in force, but after a stiff fight was repulsed in our front. But later he succeeded in driving back the troops on the right, and he occupied positions between the battalion and the village. 8.30 p.m. A party of C Company under Lieutenant R.B. Marriott Watson, which was returning to the village, came in contact with a strong party of the enemy. Lieutenant Marriott Watson spoke to the enemy in German and succeeded in allaying their suspicion, thus enabling the party to get to close quarters to rush and disperse the enemy. 10 p.m. The battalion withdrew to a line 300 yards west of the village. No contact could be established with troops on either flanks. The night passed quietly, although the enemy could be heard, evidently in force, in the immediate front. March 24th. Touch was established with troops who had during the night moved forward. Enemy machine gun fire was very heavy during the morning, but no infantry advanced to the attack on the battalion front. Although on the right and left he succeeded in driving back our troops, our flanks were slightly withdrawn to form defensive flanks. 2 p.m. The enemy advance proceeded by a very heavy artillery bombardment in overwhelming strength on our front and both flanks, and although the battalion put up a most stubborn resistance, all with the exception of about 10 wounded other ranks and 10 unwounded were killed or taken prisoner. The following officers became casualties during the day. Captain Thompson, missing. Captain Bryans, missing. Lieutenant and Adjutant Moore, missing. Lieutenant Marriott Watson, missing. Lieutenant Boyle, missing. Lieutenant Strawn, missing. Most were prisoners, some were dead. March 26, to give you an idea of just how thoroughly this battalion had been annihilated, this entry from their war diary a couple of days later. The situation being somewhat obscured, the battalion, consisting of four officers and 50 other ranks under the command of Captain Murphy, took up a defensive position. In other words, um, somebody would have come along and thought they were it was a platoon. The war diary and the record still talk about, you know, the Second Royal Irish Rifles were here or they were engaged there. But 50 men with four officers doesn't really count as a battalion in my book. Now, of course, I got interested in Marriott Watson, this guy who spoke to the Germans in sufficiently fluently that he was able to fool them into thinking that they were German troops to allow them to get close enough to get into close quarters and use bayonets and so on. So I thought, I want to find out who he is. And with a name like Marriott Watson, surely I can find him. And when I started searching, I initially found his father, who was considerably more fam famous, Henry Brereton Marriott Watson, from 1863 to 1921. Now, you can tell from my accent that I'm a New Zealander, and I also lived in Australia for, for a, a number of years as well. So it was fascinating to me to realize that this Henry Marriott Watson was born in Australia, but grew up in New Zealand and was educated in Christchurch. And um, he became... He later moved to England to try to get a job as a journalist and became rather well known as a novelist. And he wrote quite a number of books. If you look on his Wikipedia page, you'll see a, an entry of all the different titles. 
And then here's a quote from Wikipedia. Although now largely forgotten, Merritt Watson's contribution to gothic horror during the latter part of the 19th century is notable for its romantic decadence. Well, if you want to go and read some gothic horror, including romantic decadence, well, this might be your cup of tea. The stories appeared in such collections as Diogenes of London in 1893 and The Heart of Miranda, published in 1898. Also, The Stone Chamber, a vampire novel that was published just one year after Bram Stoker's Dracula was published. And um, he moved in the literary circles. Um, he knew Bernard Shaw. He knew H.G. Wells, amongst others. And um, he had one son only, and that was Richard Brereton Marriott Watson, who was killed in this battle. He was not one of the one. He was listed as missing, but he was dead. And uh, having lost his only son, he took to heavy drinking and died in 1921 of cirrhosis of the liver. And here is his son, Richard Brereton Marriott Watson. He is remembered on the Posiers Memorial, the same place that my great uncle William Francis from the 11th Fusiliers is remembered. And you can see over there on the left, under the Royal Irish Rifles, Lieutenant Marriott Watson RB Military Cross. You can see he looks like a rather dashing young man, and he's actually known as one of the war poets. He wrote a number of um, World War I poetry, and I found this one. This is probably his best-known poem, Kismet. Opal fires in the western sky, for that which is written must ever be, and a bullet comes droning, whining by, to the heart of a sentry close to me. For some go early and some go late, a dying scream on the evening air, and who is there that believes in fate, as the soul goes out in the sunset flare. And uh, yeah, some go early, some go late. Well, he had been in the war since 1914, so I guess he was one of the ones who went late, predicted in his rather pessimistic, um, negative-sounding World War I poetry. And um, as I kept looking for him, I was amazed to stumble upon this particular um, blog called Worm Woodiana. It says, this blog is devoted to fantasy, supernatural, and decadent literature. It was begun by Douglas A. Anderson and Mark Valentine and joined by friends including James Doig and Jim Rockhill to present relevant news and information. And this is what I found. Richard Brereton Merritt Watson was reported missing in action on March 1918 and later presumed dead. The son of a novelist and poet, he had taught himself Japanese so that he could translate some of the exquisite and fugitive verses in that country's literature. They were published in a journal just one week before he was lost. He probably did not leave. He did not live to see them in print. Now his versions of the Japanese poems have been rediscovered and brought back into print for the first time. Joe Valentine has created a limited numbered edition of 25 handmade books which respond to the young translator's work in a sympathetic and striking design using Japanese handmade paper and Japanese stab binding. Mark Valentine provides a short introductory note about R.B. Marriott Watson. The book is the first publication of their new imprint, Valentine and Valentine. Other titles are in preparation, but you can't get one because they're all sold out. 3rd of April 2013, all copies have now been taken. Thank you for your interest. A new title will be announced soon. So, this guy. So, he's the son of a famous novelist. He's obviously a talented linguist. He can speak German well enough to fool the Germans into letting his... British um, platoon get close enough. Um, he's taught himself Japanese and translated Japanese poetry. And um, it really got me thinking. And I've, it's not the first time I've had this thought, but how many brilliant people who could have changed the world died in World War I? Because it didn't matter how smart you were, the, a, a random artillery shell or a random bullet is going to take you out. I had this thought before when I was thinking about the New Zealander Aitken. He was a private at Gallipoli. He was a sergeant in the absolute disaster of the Otago Infantry. I've described in my episode, Massacre of the Otago Infantry. Uh, later, he was an officer on the Somme, badly wounded in the ankle. Um, and he later goes on to become a professor of mathematics at Edinburgh University. A brilliant man with a near photographic memory. So many times he could have ended up dead. So he survived and he went on to make a real difference in the world. Um, how many other people could there have been who would have made a real difference, who would have changed the world, who just got taken out by that random bullet or that random engagement? Okay, maybe 
not everybody's going to have a huge impact, but of those hundreds of th- and hundreds of thousands of casualties in World War One, how many British, how many German, how many New Zealanders and Australians who would have invented something incredible or made a real difference somewhere in the world? This um, picture, by the way, was put for the uh, in was well, it's a commemoration in New Zealand for all the New Zealanders who died in World War One. Each cross represents a New Zealander, and they did it in front of the Auckland War Memorial Museum. I think it was in 2015 for the 100th anniversary of the Gallipoli landings. And this is a German war memorial. Unseren Gefallen, our fallen, our dead, in other words. It's a war memorial in the heart of Munich. It's not very prominent. You really have to go and hunt for it, as I did, because I wanted to see it. But after all, it wasn't just the... British who lost lots of men, how many brilliant scientists or, you know, poets or other linguists or whatever from Germany simply didn't survive the war. Now the Germans in Cooney. Patrols are advanced on the road to Ham and to Villazelv. Lieutenant Kopel of the 2nd Battalion makes a cycling patrol towards Libermont. He is wounded but brings back valuable information. Now finally the formations can be reorganised. Also in Cooney, we found a supply store with rich pickings, so that the German field kitchens had to turn back with full cookers. There was a great deal of confusion in the village, because squads from all three regiments of the division were moving about in the streets. Midnight approaches, and the troops hope finally to find some hours of undisturbed rest, the first since the 19th of March. But it didn't turn out that way. As soon as deep sleep envelops the men who are much in need of rest, a bombardment howls and barks into Cooney with a wild crash. The English, who of course knew what attraction the supply depot would have, bombards the place. A wild frenzied race is the result. We try to avoid the heavy impacts, but there was nothing to do but pull the battalions back behind the edge of the village. Here the grenadiers found some very short hours of rest. And then this is going to be the end of Foley's War. As quickly as possible the men were led out to where they were to dig, just to the west of Cooney. And with entrenching tools, for we had no shovels, they started on the big task of getting down under cover before daylight. My own men, realising the value of a good trench when shells and bullets are flying, got to work with a will, and were soon under quite substantial cover. But the Shropshires, who were, well they found a few couple of companies of the Shropshires, who were totally green. But the Shropshires, who besides being thoroughly tired, were also quite new to the game, needed continual watching and urging to make them dig it all. In spite of this and the danger of our situation, it was the greatest comfort to me to be doing something definite towards stopping the overwhelming enemy advance, feeble and unsupported though our effort was. Now, the accounts of Foley don't exactly mesh with the war diary entries and the other ones, so I'm not exactly sure what's going on, but at some point they have retreated to the west of Cooney, and in his map, in his book published in 1920, he made a map of Cooney, Um, You can see here that it's not a north-south map, so you would have to turn it to the right to align it the same way as the the trench map. But you can see here that the troops he's with, which includes his surviving company, are dug in to the either side of the main road leading out of Cooney, plus they have a keep with um, Shropshire's and Foley himself is up there at the front. And then what Foley describes is the first German attack comes in on their extreme right, and then the Germans come in also on their left. So this seem, this is me just reconstructing what Foley put on his map that you see on the right. And that's where Foley is with the keep of the Shropshires. And here's what he wrote. Um, he believed that the, it was only, you know, a matter of hours until the you know substantial british re- um, reinforcements arrived he was completely wrong there was just nothing available i'm actually going to make a major episode later about how the new zealand division was brought down to try and plug the gap it was a desperate fighting fortunately for the british i think the new zealanders had actually been brought off the front line and had been had the whole month of march to train they were actually being got ready for offensive open country warfare they were going through that exact kind of training that they would need and the new zealand division just because of the way it was organized was actually the strongest division that the british had it had more men in it than any other division and they and the australians were given desperate orders get down south and find the germans and stop them like at this point they didn't even really know where the germans were 
but that will be for another episode. Foley believed that they were coming up any moment, but it would be quite a long time yet. It would be well into April before they could stop the German advance. Now, back to Foley's account. At about noon, the enemy machine gun fire showed a marked increase, and this we knew to be the harbinger of a fresh attack. The advance was made in the first place on our extreme right, and we had a perfectly clear view of the whole thing. We let the enemy get well out of the village. The German advance was made by short rushes across the open in excellent order, and as they scrambled to their feet and raced for it, we poured lead into them at a range of 300 yards. I took the rifle from the man next to me and settled down to killing Germans with a lust, which, when considered in cooler moments afterwards, rather amazed me. We could hardly miss at so short a range, and their casualties were very heavy, especially among the machine gunners who had to move in pairs with their heavy weapons slung on a sort of stretcher between them. And there's a picture from one of these, um, the German advance, and you can see there over on the left, what they're talking about the, a stretcher carrying these German machine guns. So you're advancing through open country, 300 yards in front of British riflemen who are dug in and able to aim and shoot you down as you're trying to carry these things in advance. What a nightmare. We had rather forgotten in our thirst for enemy blood how quickly ammunition can be exhausted, and long before I expected it, the men were reporting that they'd run out. And from that moment, we became little more than spectators. Proportionately, as our fire slackened, the Germans had pushed on. In a kind of fascination, we watched them push on, covered by the fire of a 4.2-inch battery, until suddenly our main line broke, and we saw its garrison running in a confused mob down the road. Now, I know that's a British... It's actually a New Zealand soldier in the foreground, um, but they're actually test-firing a German 4.2-inch. So that is a German gun, even though it's a New Zealand soldier in the foreground, from the National Library of New Zealand. I observed now that the garrison of my position had been reduced through departure to the rear and casualties to only a couple of men besides myself. We three with us, as it were, in Ireland, entirely surrounded by a sea of victorious enemies. The gravity of the situation came home to me with sparkling clearness. And when he's considering what he's going to do next, you should remember psychologically that he had already had an older brother who had died at an earlier point in the war. And, uh, there was a uh, Jeffrey Foley had died in May of 1917, and this is what Foley had written about his older brother. Ready as I thought it was to bear it, the shock of the news when it came was almost unendurable. It was terrible to think of the poor bereaved home, how ill we could spare his sunny boyish nature, his irrepressible laugh, his unselfish ready comradeship. To soften with pride some of the pain of loss, there came gradually to us the story of his last fight. He was seen in the act of shooting down an enemy machine gunner with his revolver. A wound in the foot, however, had crippled him, and for many hours he lay helpless. By the time he reached the casualty clearing station at Albany, septic poisoning had set in. Two amputations, first below and then above the knee, were insufficient to save him, and on May 17th he passed away. His last letter to his mother, written not long before unconsciousness overtook him, is one of the finest and saddest things I ever saw. So full is it of courage and intense desire to hide the weakness which he felt creeping over him and which foiled in every wavering word his splendid, plucky effort to allay the anxiety of those who waited him at home. So now Foley himself has to decide what he's going to do. We were now in one of those plights when a soldier has to consult whatever conscience he may possess, and choose between a death of doubtful glory but obvious futility, or surrender. We had just killed how many of their fellows? Why should they not shoot us down now? Well, they didn't. Thus, in bitter passing, ended my three years of active service in France. In a few minutes, we joined the little straggling, despondent groups who were trailing back through the German lines. With all those grey figures around us, I had the sensation of being swallowed alive. Very little notice was taken of us at this point. Remember, just head to the back, head to the back. We're not taking you, we're not supervising you, just head back. I joined a company with two officers of the Liverpools who were amongst the party. Our first stopping place was a small dressing station where a little crowd of interested spectators gathered round to have a look at us. They were quite friendly and gave us cigarettes. The whole countryside seemed to be alive with Germans, and all the way back we met battalion after battalion of grey-clad steel-helmeted troops marching with a steady, inexorable pace towards the battle line. And there's a whole line of British prisoners just loosely supervised by Germans going back to a dressing station you can see there at the back. And uh, I couldn't help but notice in the photo this one guy wearing that interesting hat. wonder who he is and how he ended up with a hat like that instead of a steel helmet. So, 
uh, after it's all done, the first Royal Irish Rifles have retreated all the way to Belu, um, and uh, the Germans are in complete possession of Cooney. Now, this is where I stop. Of course, the battle doesn't stop there, and I could have gone on and on. In fact, there's a whole interesting account I was tempted to include a little bit southwest of this, where there's actually a British cavalry charge, a successful cavalry charge. Um, you might find it hard to believe there were actually still mounted troops charging enemy um, formations uh, as late as March of 1918, but there was. Um, but at a certain point, you have to call it quits, and this two-parter has already gone on long enough, so this was the point where I decided to call it quits. So I'm going to end with a summary from the official history. It's this multi-volume thing. I, I bit the bullet and bought the whole damn thing um, because it is terribly useful, and all the volumes you see there only cover 1918. I haven't yet bought the 1917 and the earlier ones. And this is their summary of how things have been going. Trained in and accustomed to trench warfare, Little practiced in open fighting and entirely unpracticed in the conduct of retreat, units in formation were inclined to leave a position directly one of its flanks was turned. The opportunities of dealing with parties of the enemy who advanced into pockets were practically neglected. Without the use of telegraphic and telephonic communication with their brigades, which the signal sections, even had they possessed the material, could neither lay nor maintain at the speed of this new form of warfare, with the congestion of the roads preventing the use of cars, and the shell-pitted and broken service of the devastated area slowing down the pace of horses, divisional staffs were unable to keep in constant touch with the front. Even communication between the corps and divisions was irregular and belated. Orders to hold positions to the last might be sent, but even if they reached their destination, it was often too late or impossible to carry out. What might have been a series of rearguard actions became a mere retirement from one line to another. Now... Do you really think that the story that I've just recounted through these two episodes matches what the official military history says? I certainly do not. Yes, there were perhaps may have been some formations that withdrew without putting up a good fight when they were flanked. But in this battle that I've just recounted on the breakthrough of the Crozet Canal, the troops fought and they fought hard. Sometimes they fought to the last. And when they did withdraw, it would, they only withdrew when they were in an absolutely untenable position where it was absolutely required. Battalions that didn't withdraw, like the 2nd Battalion of the Royal Irish Rifles, were obliterated. The 7th Somerset Rifles were obliterated. Um, it was... I really don't think this is a fair description, particularly when you bear in mind that there was a 10 to 1 numerical advantage that the Germans had in attacking this position. They, in most cases, they fought until they ran out of ammunition or were in an impossible position. And of course, the battalion I'm most interested in, the one with my great uncle in it, in the, the 11th Battalion of the Royal Fusiliers, just south of Jussi, um, as I'll recount again in more detail, um, they didn't get the orders to retreat. So Jussi on their left flank fell, the battalion that was on their right flank got the orders to withdraw. The Fusiliers stayed in place because they'd been told to fight to the last. And as a result, they were being attacked on the front. They got flanked on the left and the right. They had open fields behind them with no way to retreat. So of course they got overrun and obliterated. Um, sometimes you absolutely had to withdraw. And as for not taking advantage of the opportunities, well, again, I really think that the official history is rather unfair on a lot of brave men who did their absolute best in impossible situations. And that is finally the end of this grand, long, two-part episode, but I wanted to give it justice and tell the whole story. If you're like me and you want all the details, well, I've done my best to give it to you. I mean, not everybody would have got through this almost four hours of stuff, but there it, there it was. I hope you enjoyed it, so I'm going to say... Good evening to you.